Thank you so much, Scout. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Such a beautiful way to start worship this morning. Good morning and welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Bellingham, Washington. And for those of you who are in the bigger balcony, which is our online worship presence, welcome here among us. It is good to be together in whatever way or whatever time we get to gather together in worship. My name is Sharon Benton and I'm the lead pastor and it is my joy to welcome you. In this season of Lent, we are about midway through. Thanks be to God, spring is coming. Easter is coming, and yet here we are in this moment, in this time. I have a few announcements as we begin. Um, first, if you are visiting with us, welcome, glad you are here. And folks, if you are more familiar with First Congregational and you see a face that is unfamiliar to you or less familiar, just say hello, greet somebody that you maybe don't know yet. Um, let's extend that extravagant welcome. You'll also see that there are red books at the end of the pews, and we are asking you to please pass those down, write your name, and then pass them back so that those who are in the pews with you can um, know who's sitting near them and can say hello to you by name. Those of you who are in the bigger balcony, if you are able to write in the chat that you are here, please do so we can greet you. And if not, just let us know online somehow, um, either in the worship, sorry, on the website, you can um, leave a prayer um, comments note on the, on the website. We are re-beginning or restarting our visioning process. Um, we have been get it, gearing up for this for the last couple of years, friends. And um, in the mail, you should be receiving a purple envelope with some stickers on it to let you know, please open me and engage in some of the questions that you find there. And maybe those questions, maybe some of them will stir you and some of them just not. Answer the ones that do connect for you. Um, we are also going to be holding workshops, both on Zoom and person, to engage some of that visioning work that we're doing with First Congregational. The first one is actually this Tuesday, evening at 7 p.m. There's information about that in the Friday announcements email. But if you have missed that or don't receive that, please don't hesitate to contact Pastor Davi or me. Let's see. We're having another pantry drive for the Birchwood Food Desert Fighters. And that's going to be this coming Saturday. Uh, you can drop off foodstuffs in our church parking lot here between 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. If you're interested in what kind of things that they're looking for, like canned jam, fresh food, other things, um, you can go on the church website onto the blog. It's fccb.net. On the blog, there's a list of food items that are helpful for fighting that food desert. Spring cleanup on our grounds is coming up. If you're interested in participating in any way, um, let us know. We also have the opportunity for folk to take some charge of our children's gardens. So if you're interested in what that might mean, how you might participate in that, um, you can reach out again to any of your staff. Most importantly, the most important announcement we share each week, something that we hope that you feel in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, in your whole self. No matter who you are, and no matter where you are on life's journey, no matter if life is good and you have hope filling you to the brim, no matter if life is hard and you are fearing that hope is empty, no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here and you are beloved of God. Let's worship. We 
please join with me in the call to worship. Life abundant calls to us. To be alive, fully aware, awake in this world rich in beauty and wonder. Through death and destruction will have their way Let us not settle for the days that are dry and brittle with despair. Holy One, we recognize these lives of ours are so vulnerable, so precious, so deeply entangled with one another. We long to protect, to protect ourselves, our families, and our planet in our efforts. Let us be consumed by fear that we turn to destruction or hard-heartedness or security. Keep our hearts tender to one another and lead us into paths of peace with justice. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. If you are comfortable sharing signs of peace, I invite you to come forward and share peace of Christ with the folk in the bigger balcony. Check in with each other, bump elbows, say good morning. Folk, write in the uh, comments that peace of Christ be with you or make a phone call to somebody and wish them peace. Again, the peace of Christ be with all of us. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Good morning. Peace be with you all. Nice to see so many children over there. There is something so healing, so life-giving about telling our stories. In the prayer of confession, that is what we get to do. The mask comes off. Any pretense of perfection is removed. Let the pressure to perform slip away and we sit here face to face with God sharing honestly who we long to be friends there is healing here there is life to be gained here 
So join me in this moment of honesty. Join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, we treat our self-worth like something that can be bought in a store. But you know this even better than we do. Instead of trusting that we are made good, instead of trusting that we are loved exactly as we are, we stockpile our values in earthly things, in trophies and awards, in likes and follows, in wealth and power. Forgive us for creating our own measuring stick. Heal our open wounds and tell our hearts that we won't be forgotten. If we slow down, we will not be forgotten. If we rest, gratefully we pray. Amen. Beloved of God, take a deep breath. Relax the tension in your jaw. There is good news here. For even when we stumble, even when we take the easy way out, even when we forget our own self-worth, even when we lose our way, we belong to God. We are loved. We are claimed. We are under God's wing. We are worthy of grace. We belong to God. Amen. Out of this prayer of forgiveness, I invite you to join me in a time of prayer for ourselves, for our congregation, for our community, and for all the world. God of growing things, for the blooms that take flight in the wind, for the slow emerging roots deep underground. God, we pray that you will teach us the wise patience of growing things, the wise patience of your heart. And God, in these lengthening days, we pray that you will bring healing to those we love. God, we pray for Sandy, the aunt of Max B, who passed away last week. Bring comfort and peace to her family in the midst of the several deaths they've experienced this last year. 
bring hope and rest in the midst of these challenging times. God, we pray also for our sister, Bert M. We give thanks she was able to go home from the hospital this week, but we hold her in prayers as she continues in the midst of health challenges. God, bless her and her family. Bless all of those who care for her and all of those who wait earnestly for her healing. God, we pray for those with cancer in this season. In active treatment or in remission, however it appears in their bodies, God, we pray for your healing presence in their bodies, in their communities, in the health care workers who provide care and treatment. Give strength, give courage, give healing, give that wise, steady patience. God, we pray for peace in Ukraine and throughout our world. We especially pray for safety for all of those affected by warfare, those wounded and killed, those made refugees by the violence. Provide safe places to rest for all of your children and teach us again how to make peace and how to claim our voices for peacemaking in our communities and beyond. God, you who move alongside the slow growing of roots, grow in our hearts again, renew us, strengthen us, lead us. We pray for these things, and we pray for the names we, we speak out loud or in our hearts right now. Hear our prayers, O oh God. We pray these prayers that we speak out loud or offer in our hearts or call out with the seagulls in the distance, God, in your many names and in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray like this. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells a story of a fruitless fig tree once planted with promise, 
only to grow barren and brittle. The landowner in the parable has returned to its empty branches for three years. With patience worn thin and hope withered, he commands the gardener to cut it down, seeing it as a liability to the soil. But where the landowner sees waste, the gardener perceives possibility that lies fallow. For the gardener has learned from the land that life flows in cycles, budding, flourishing, pruning, death. And so he requests one more year. Cutting the earth with a shovel, he loosens the clots that have settled like stone, so that when water comes, the earth will receive it like a soft kiss. He blankets the roots with manure so that growth can be steadied by hope. And then he lets go. What happens to the fig tree? Does it live? Does it die? Does it bear any fruit? We don't know. And so if we can't read the end of this story, then we must write it with our own lives. Because we know what it feels like to be the fig tree, to be deemed worthless, to be weary enough to believe that we don't deserve to be well. And perhaps we also know what it's like to see the world through the eyes of the landowner, calculating worth based on what we produce, what we accomplish, what we provide. Can we cultivate the vision of the great gardener? The one who sees you for what you are becoming? The one who tends, nourishes, and lets go? Perhaps for us, the fruit is not the ending. The fruit is in the waiting, in the dead of winter, in the manure, the nurture, the rest, the darkness. The fruit is in all of it, sowing seeds we can't yet see. Please join me in an affirmation of faith. We believe that the God of the cosmos is at work here. We believe that God is fertilizing the soil. We believe that God is planting roots. We believe that God is growing fruit that is yet to be tasted. But on that promised day, when the fig tree stands tall, and swords are beaten into plowshares. We believe when our work does not bear fruit, God still loves us. When our soil grows dry and cracked, God still longs for us. When all seems hopeless here on earth, God holds hope for us. The God of the cosmos is at work here. We believe, help our unbelief. A reading from scripture, Luke chapter 13, verses six through nine, the parable of the barren fig tree. 
Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Hello, hello. Um, We have kiddos this week, and you're hiding in the back there, but I need your help. I've got one coming. That's great. It's mine, so that's good. Um, I think you're going to want to play, because I've got this cup here, but it's empty. And the whole whole thing, this Lent, is full to the brim, right? So we've got to fill it up, and I need your help. So I'm going to set the cup down here. I gotta move. I gotta move. You know what we're looking for? Yeah. What are, Easter eggs. That's right. We are. They're hidden. There are eggs. Look out here. Do you see any? Go find them. Go get them. Go get them and bring them back up here and fill up the cup. Into the cup. Some of you out there might see them too. You might need to help. <gasps> Keep filling. There's more. Keep finding. Keep finding. Yeah. Oh, don't open them yet. Fill the cup. Oh man, that cup is getting really full. Oh no, what do we do? When I'm thinking about filling things, sometimes I fill a bucket instead of a cup. Oh my gosh, you found all of them? Well, keep going, fill that bucket instead. It's all about filling your bucket. Look, they're coming from everywhere. They're coming from everywhere. Fill that bucket up. Fill it up. I'm all about a little chaos in church. (laughs) Yeah, fill that bucket up. Oh my gosh, there's more. There's more. I still see bunches. There's more. Get it, get it, Nolan. There's some over here. Look. There's lots on this side. Brennan, over here. Yeah, in that bucket. There we go. There's lots over there. There's lots over there. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, yeah. We're finding them. People, people on the bigger balcony, there are, there's adults on their knees out here. They're diving. It's intense. I, oh, my gosh, you've got tons. People have got, like, multiple in each hand. Oh, look, there's more over here. Yay. Keep going. There's one by Sharon. Oh, oh, my gosh. We've got one with, like, multiple... Oh, yep. There we go. Keep filling it. How many can we get in there? Oh, they're flying down the center aisle right now. There's just... Oh, my goodness. Oh, this is a really full bucket. Oh, man. How many more can we stack on there? Oh, no. They're they're starting to fill off the bucket. It's overflowing. Oh, my gosh. Keep stacking them. See what you can do. Yes. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Time out. Time out. Time out. We've, the bucket is overflowing. What do we do? A bigger bucket. That's an option. Another option is maybe we could share them with people, right? Okay. Who has seen what's inside them? Who's peeked? Oh, no one sees. Everybody open one. They fell apart. Okay, so what do you see inside? What do you see inside? Show me. Are they all the same? What what do they have on them? Faces. Faces. What do the faces look like? 
happy. There's a happy one. What? Silly. Uh, there's one with one eyeball. I don't know what that is. Nerdy. I love that. Is there a sad one? Okay. So there's a lot of emotions in this bucket. And you know what? Sometimes our heart is filled with emotions too. Sometimes I've got a lot of joy. And you know what I do with that? I share it with other people. And you know what? Sometimes they're loving these stickers. So this is really for you guys. Sometimes we could give some to people. You know what? When I have too much worry or sadness, sometimes I talk with somebody else and they take a little bit of that worry and then my bucket's not so full. We could share them, yeah. And you know the great thing about this church and this community? Just wait a second. It's chaos. I love it. The great thing about this community is that that's what we do together. We celebrate together. And we have sadness together. And we learn together and we ask questions together. And as you guys all around the sanctuary, because I've totally lost them, grow up in this church, what you'll learn is that everybody out here has a little to give to you if your bucket is feeling low. And if your bucket is feeling too full of anything in particular, this community is here to support you as well. So I'm going to pray real quick, then we're going to take these eggs to the side, and then we'll hand out these stickers to everybody afterwards, okay? Nolan, you're doing a great job. I love it. <laughs> Let's pray. We'll open them in the back when we're all done. We'll just we'll, we'll transition. It'll be great. God, thank you for all of the gifts that we're given. Thank you for chaos in the sanctuary, for joy, for all of these emotions that we have, and for the community that we get to celebrate them in, that we get to share um, all of these celebrations together, and that our buckets and our cups are full to the brim. Amen. Okay, now... You can kind of take them. Good to have chaos again. I mean, not the kind of chaos that we've had these last two years. Different kind. Feeling full to the brim. I'm going to pull you back to the picture of that fig tree. That fig tree growing there. All I could think every time I kept reading the text this week poor fig tree, outcast in the middle of the vineyard, not part of a big fig family, but growing solo amidst a bunch of grapevines. Soil seems just fine for some fruit, but clearly not for figs. Cut it down. Was the vineyard grower going on a cost-benefit analysis? Was it really such a desirable little plot of land that the tree grew on? Or did it just seem that this tree wasn't worth what the grower thought it should be? Because it didn't produce. All calculations indicating that output should have been more. If the world were to do a cost-benefit analysis on you, what would the accounting show? Are you contributing enough in the right ways? Are you worth the ground that you are taking up? I feel nauseous saying those words. I felt nauseous writing those words this week. 
Probably because I know that our society thinks exactly in those terms. You need to earn your keep. You need to make good grades and have lots of friends and participate in cool extracurriculars. You need to parent like you don't work outside the home and you need to work as if you aren't parenting as well. We're making judgments all the time about our worth and others' worth. But who is making up the conditions or defining the premises on how we assess? Who set the parameters for how you measure up? I've heard this parable interpreted before, and I have never quite gotten it. And maybe it's because Jesus was in a particular time and place when he told it, and I am not there. Living where he was, seeing what he saw, hearing what he heard, knowing what his hearers knew about everyday life in first century Middle Eastern contexts. I've heard this parable interpreted as being about time and repentance. There's still time to repent. You've got another year, tree, before we cut you down. Another year to produce the fruits of atonement, mulched and manured, given more information about sin and how not to do it, so that productivity can finally happen and you won't be cut down. But this year, this year I have been reading more commentaries on scripture written by women of color and gender non-binary folk alongside the centuries of white male interpreters that I still do read. And this week, the starkness of the differences between those commentaries, well, they've confused me and shocked me and made me wonder yet again, or actually even more, what the heck to do with this parable? In particular, the Sanctified Art Commentary written this week by Reverend Larissa Kwong Abazia has captured my spiritual imagination. Reverend Kwong Abazia writes, Many of us experience the world as a fig tree in the midst of grapevines. We're placed in fields not meant for us and yet expected to thrive. People discount and doubt us, threatening to cut us down if we don't produce in the ways that have been defined on our behalf. We're afterthoughts, demanded to bear fruit or be destroyed. Reverend Kwong Abazia's words convicted me. They made me pause, wondering what else our capitalist culture demands, this fruitfulness, particularly as it was built on slavery and the cheap labor of immigrants, railroad builders, factory and farm workers. Go ahead, fig tree, thrive, I dare ya. Yes, you are being treated like a grapevine, fertilized and watered as a grapevine, planted in a place that is at minimum antagonistic to your life, if not downright hostile to it. But thrive. Produce in the way that we have named for you. Reverend Kwong Abazia continues, the story of the fig tree reminds us that the world's expectations do not need to be ours. The gardener puts their faith in that which they have no control, digging a bigger hole and filling it with manure. The gardener tends to the tree with everything that it needs to grow so that it can grow into its purpose. Perhaps that means bearing figs. Or maybe it provides shade for the laborers during the harvest. 
or an opportunity for the gardener to tend to the fields in a new way, learn a new way of gardening, or even transformation of the owner's ability to see beyond the commodification of the land. What would it look like for us to transform the expectations of a transactional mentality, a give-forget way of living? To be able to slough off the imposed cost-benefit assessment of you are not good enough or worthy enough to deserve the nutrient-filled soil that feeds your particular existence. What would it be like to transform the world for those around us? I recently reread the book, the book, The Good, Good Pig, which is an incredibly sweet memoir by the naturalist Cy Montgomery. She wrote it about her 14-year love affair with Christopher Hogwood, a runt piglet who grew into a 750-pound great spiritual master. In this, I swear it's a sweet book, so just prepare yourself for this, but in it she writes, usually a sow doesn't want to raise more than 10 piglets. Usually a sow has 10 good working teats. When a sow has more than 10 piglets, somebody is going to lose out. And that somebody is the runt. A runt is distinguished not only by its small size and helpless predicament, unless pulled from the litter and nursed by people, a runt is usually doomed for it is a threat to the entire pig family. A runt will make this awful sound. It's just awful. It would attract predators. So the sow's response is often to bite the runt in half to stop the noise. chop down the fig tree. To keep the rest of her litter safe, the sow does what she has to do. But then we come to this parable. The gardener stops the ax from cutting down the tree. The author stepped in to nurture the runt. Somebody steps in to transform the outcome. And this makes me ponder, are we to interpret that God is the vineyard owner in the parable? Checking out the land and seeing what's producing and what isn't? That's the traditional interpretation. Or is God maybe the gardener, the one who steps in, adding the manure, cultivating the earth? Maybe God is the tree or the vineyard or the soil, all of the above. And where are we in the parable, you and me? Are you a vineyard owner trying to clear out the waste, make things better for the rest of the growth around the tree? Are you the gardener, nurturing, caring? Are you the tree, finding that your cost-benefit analysis comes up short? Are you maybe the earth, solid and ready? Maybe it depends entirely on when and where you're hearing the parable. 
Reverend Kwong Abazia encourages, those of us living a fig tree existence are invited to be nourished and tended to so that in time we grow into our purpose. Not the purpose that somebody else puts on us, but our true God-given purpose. And people with power, people with power are reminded to disrupt their knowledge of how the world works and their complicity in earthly systems and measurements so that everyone has an opportunity to thrive. And still others, still others provide nurture in solidarity, trusting that intentional care will, will lead to new life. Together, Kwangabazia says, together we invest in a fruitful creation. What can we do to give ourselves and other people every possible opportunity to live their most fruit producing selves, their most loving selves, loving to themselves, loving of others, loving to God? Are there ways that we can fertilize the ground? Even though our society makes it seem like we need to produce to be worth the ground that we grow on, even though we're told, cut down the fig tree, dispose of the runt, do better, work harder, give and give and give, maybe there are other ways to see the world around us, other ways to read the parable. Maybe we need to transform the expectations that we put on ourselves and those around us. Friends, give it another year. Give it another year and do the work. Cultivate. Let's see what grows in God's garden. But do the work. Amen.
love that parable about the fig tree. My grandmother had a fig tree in her backyard, and as a kid, I loved climbing up in that tree and eating the fresh figs right off the branches. Just like I remember climbing the apricot tree in my parents' backyard and eating the apricot seed. They were a lot of them still green. I love that. I love the cherry tree I had in my backyard in San Jose, California. I love that cherries right for the, if I could keep the birds away from it. And Sharon's sermon reminded me of another story. In the early days of flight, a man came up to the Wright brothers and he said, what is the value of this airplane thing? And Orville responded, what is the value of a newborn child? Now, uh, in your bulletins, you'll see a listing of different ways in which you can uh, make your offerings to the church. Uh, times have changed. Please uh, go through that, see which works best for you. Um, and uh, so now I will ask the ushers to please come forward and collect today's offering. Thank you. Nurture us.
tender God like the fig tree. Remind us, teach us, demonstrate in us our worth, our blessedness, our belovedness, until it overflows. So that next year, and in all the years to come, we would be signs, we would be bodies, we would be proclaimers of your healing love. Lead us and send us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.